All right, let's do problem number 11 from the review packet. The first part says, well, so the question is, are these statements always true, sometimes true, or never true? So if P of X is a polynomial, then it must be true that limit X approaches A of P of X equals P of A. Well, this is the definition for P being continuous at a point A. So the question is, if P of X is a polynomial, does it have to be continuous at some arbitrary point A? And the answer is yes, because all polynomials are continuous functions on their entire domains. So this one is always true. All right, next one. If we have two functions, f and g, and each of their limits as x approaches zero go to infinity, then it must be true that the limit of f minus g as x goes to zero equals zero. <clears throat> All right, so this is sometimes true. Um, let's look at two examples. So let's say f equals one over x and, nope, one over x squared, and g equals one over x squared. Um, for each of these functions, uh, limit as x goes to zero approaches infinity. Um, what happens when I subtract them? I've got one over x squared minus one over x squared. Using the equivalent function theorem, this is equivalent to the function zero. So the limit as x approaches zero of that function is zero as requested. So that makes this statement look like it should be true, or at least that's an example of one pair of functions for which it's true. Is there an example where this is shown to be false? And the answer is yes. Let's say f is one over x squared and g is one over x to the fourth. All right, so it's still true that as x approaches zero, each of these individually, the limit approaches infinity. So is it true that this resulting claim is true as x approaches zero, one over x squared minus one over x to the fourth equals zero. All right, well, let's, let's think about this. So here I'll multiply this by x squared over x squared so that I can combine them. So that will give me x squared minus one over x to the fourth. And we're looking at the limit of that as x approaches zero. So what is this limit going to be? It seems like as x approaches zero, this is approaching zero very quickly. So if we, if we think about it this way, one over x to the fourth times x squared minus one, this is approaching, this is approaching infinity very quickly. All right, on the other hand, when we uh, evaluate this section, um, this part of the limit is approaching negative one. So to me, that implies, uh, again, that we have a sort of vertical asymptote here. If you think about the left hand and the right hand limits, when x approaches zero from the left, these terms are gonna be positive and this term is gonna be negative, so overall the values will be negative. When x approaches zero from the positive side, this will be positive, and again, this will be negative. So the overall value of this expression should be negative. So because this is approaching infinity very quickly, um, but the overall value is negative, that implies to me that we've got a vertical asymptote, and so the overall limit here should be negative infinity, not zero. So we've got two different examples, one for which uh, the difference of the functions, the limit does equal zero, and another where it doesn't equal zero. All right, the next claim is that if the limit as x approaches infinity of a function f equals seven, then that function must have a horizontal asymptote at y equals seven. Um, this one is true all the time because of how we define horizontal asymptote. This is exactly what it means to have a horizontal asymptote, that as the x values approach infinity or negative infinity, um, the difference between our function and the number seven is going to get smaller and smaller. So in other words, the function approaches the y value seven. So this one is true all the time. All right, what about this? If we have a function f that is continuous at a value x equals a, then it must also be true that the absolute value of f is continuous at that function. Um, so this is true always and I can give you a very direct proof that that's the case. Let's rewrite what this actually means if f is continuous at a. So if that's true, we're claiming that limit x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. 
This is the definition of what it means to be continuous at a point. So we're claiming if this is true, is it also true that limit x approaches a of the absolute value of f of x equals the absolute value of f of a? Because this is what it would mean for absolute value f to be continuous at a point a. So does this statement really imply that that one's true? Well, let's rewrite this one. So uh, the absolute value. So here we've got an outer function and an inner function. We've got absolute value as the outer function, and we have f as the inner function. So I can rewrite this limit statement by moving the limit to the inside of the absolute value function, like this. So absolute value limit x approaches a of f of x. OK, why are we allowed to do this? We're allowed to do this because um, there's a limit law that says that we can. And the only thing that we have to look out for is making sure that the outer function is continuous at whatever the limit of the inner function is equal to. Um, absolute value is continuous everywhere. So we don't even need to know what the inner function approaches. Uh, we, we know that no matter what number that is, the outer function is always continuous. So it will be continuous at that point. So we were able to rewrite the left-hand side this way. Is that equal to this? Well, what is, what is limit as x approaches a of f of x? We already know what it is. It's equal to f of a, because we knew that this part was true. So I can rewrite the intersection as being equal to f of a, because I just substituted in um, what was true that we already know on the other side of the equal sign here. So now we have actually proven that um, absolute value. So, so this limit statement we've rewritten step by step to show that it actually is equal to the other side here. So that's how we know that that statement is true all the time. All right, the last one asks about the converse statement. So we're saying if absolute value f is continuous at x equals a, then f must be also. So is it true that if the absolute value of a function is continuous, then the original function must be continuous at that point as well? Um, and I think it's very fast to produce an example where that is not true. So let's say that my original function looks like this. So this is at 1 and negative 1. All right, what does absolute value f look like? Absolute value f looks like this. So here's a function. So let's look at where a equals 0, for example. Oops, 0. So absolute value f is clearly continuous. But the original f function, before we take the absolute value, is clearly not continuous at a. So this is a great example that shows that this statement is not true all the time. Um, it, it is, of course, true sometimes, though. Like I could have, I could have this. Like any, any continuous positive function for f is going to be unchanged when you take the absolute value of it. And so in that case, the absolute value being continuous also means that the original function was continuous as well. So. Um, it's it's not so it's true sometimes, but it's not true all the time.